Hi, my name is Michael Sano. I'm Jewish and I love Israel. So if you love Israel, if you love being Jewish, or if you have an unwavering connection to the land of Israel, then you're in the right place. Welcome to the 12 Cities in Israel podcast. Shalom, shalom, shalom. Hey, what's going on? What's going on? What's going on? My name is Michael Sano, and welcome, welcome, welcome to the 12 Cities in Israel podcast, the only positive podcast about the people, the food, and the culture of the state of Israel. Hey, if this is your first time watching us on YouTube, um, don't forget to hit the like button, the subscribe button, and the notification bell. And if you want to take us with you, you can find us on SoundCloud, iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, TuneIn, and on Spotify. Also, this episode of the 12 Cities in Israel podcast is brought to you by the 12 Cities in Israel Modern Hebrew Flashcards. And uh, they are one of the best ways and one of the best tools for learning Hebrew or keeping Hebrew sharp in your mind. More on that at the end of the episode. All right. Hey, welcome back to the episode. Um, This is part two of Akko. Now I have to do a little bit of caveat because I had to go into the subject line of the video and the podcast and put in parentheses Acre. Now Acre is the anglicized name for Akko. So during the Crusades, Akko became Acre because, well, they really couldn't pronounce it. I don't know. Akko, not that difficult, whatever. Um, But yeah, our whole last episode um, was part one and it was the history of Akko. And as you, if you watched it, it was a violent and tumultuous history. This history kind of evens itself out a little bit as we move into the modern city part two so we'll start with i ended with um the british mandate for palestine and now we're going to move into just the uh the remaining history for the city before we go into the modern city and that is uh israel's war for independence and the role that akko played in that um so during the early months of the war of independence uh fo- that followed israel's declaration as a state akko served as an arab base of operations against jewish settlements further to the north and for an upcoming planned attack on haifa so haifa's just so akko is on the bay of haifa and just across from Akko is Haifa, and there it was. It, it, there still is a large Arab population, a number of Arab neighborhoods in Haifa, and there are still a significant number of Arabs in Akko. Still a large group of Arabs who live in Akko, and we'll go into that a little bit later. What we're going to deal with right now is um, this threat that uh, was perceived through intelligence. And this was thwarted um, on May 13th, 1948, when forces from the Carmeli Brigade, commanded by Moshe Carmel, began Operation Ben Ami, with the intention of capturing Akko and the surrounding territory. Now, while this operation took place in territory allocated originally to the Arab state in the 1947 partition plan um, for Palestine, this partition plan was rejected by the Arab governments um, who were unwilling to accept anything other than Arab rule. With this and the aggressive actions taken by their neighbors, meaning... um, Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, Iraq, Egypt. Um, Israel thus saw no other choice than to occupy territory from which it could establish secure borders for its new nation. And that's exactly what they did. Um, And Ben Ami was basically, 
part of a war for survival. If this new state is going to survive, it has to have defensible borders. And Akko was a major strategic part of that. Um, Operation Benami started with the capture of villages east of Akko. Uh, thus strategically cutting the city off from all supply lines because Akko sits out to a point. So if you cut it off from the east, they can't get resupply. The only resupply they can get is from the Mediterranean. Um, then on the night of May 16th and 17th, mortar barrages were deployed on Arab positions within Akko and the following night it surrendered. And with that, Akko is now part of the newly established Jewish state. So that was actually, like Beresheva, that was a quick battle. Boom. Um, and what is it? Uh, military dominance was established on the battlefield, and Israel won the day. Um, but as we all know, or for those of you who don't know, this was all up in the air. This was a fledgling force. This was a brand new army. Um, all of the Arab armies were well-funded, well-armed, and, uh, it, it's almost a miracle that they were able to be as successful as they were. Um, after Operation Ben, Ben Ami, um, approximately 5,000 to 6,000 Arabs remained in Akko with the rest of them fleeing to nearby Lebanon or farther east to the city of Nazareth, which I wasn't aware of that. Um, when when flight took place, I was always under the impression that the, the flight took place outside of what became the borders of Israel. In doing research for this, I found out that um, some of the Arab uh, Arabs who fleed wound up going to neighboring Arab communities within the borders of the state of Israel. So that's pretty interesting. I had no idea. Now that's over. The war is over. Akko is now part of, according to the armistice agreement, part of the new state of Israel. Dun, dun, dun. All right. Let me take a sip of coffee. Peter Madeira, this is for you. You get this every episode. I hope you appreciate it. <laughs> Mm. Akko, the old city of Akko was just up on my screen. It's ironic how when I'm doing these, it comes up. Well, that and that it's on a repeat cycle. So, um, all right. So these remaining Arabs um, were then joined by new Jewish immigrants. And Akko's population grew um, in 1953 all the way up to 12,000 people. Wow. That's a lot of people. Um and in 1955, it, wow, it more than doubled to 32,800. So people are just coming to Akko now. Um, and I, I imagine if we look at the history, if this type of thing didn't happen after the cycles of violence that happened throughout history, you know, the, Seleuc the Seleucid attack on the Ptolemaic Akko, um, which was Ptolemaeus at the time. And uh, after, you know, all of these crusaders came in and when the Mamelukes came in and all of that, I wonder if they had these big population explosions then as well. So in um, 1967, we had another, what's this, 13,000 all, more than 13,000 to 45,800. So we went from 32,800 to 45,800. So yeah, it is 13,000. Um, and in 2002, the city was, are you ready for this? 76% Jewish, 22% Muslim, and 2% Christian. Um, and we're going to talk about this interesting religious demographic uh, in the fact that Akko has a really significant place in the world for the rest of the world to look at um, and I'm, I'm I'm pretty I'm pretty psyched and fascinated by it now with this uh, new change in the demographic uh, most of the Arab residents 
uh, chose to remain in the old city. Um, that's now that historically that is where they would have felt the most comfortable. That's where they had the most connection and neighborhood wise. That's where they wound up staying. And that flavor still exists today. That rich Islamic cultural tradition still exists in Akko in the old city. Um, now, Another wave of Jewish immigration to, uh, no, most of the Arab residents lived in the old city while the Jewish population was concentrated in developments to the north of Akko and east. Now, when I say to the north, I mean, literally like you cross the street and you're in that um, northern neighborhood. It's not like separated by barriers or separated by fields or stuff like that. It's directly north and directly east. Um one of these groups that came were the Jews from Morocco uh, who came to Akko throughout the 1950s, while another wave of Jewish immigration uh, to Akko occurred in the 1990s when Jews from the former Soviet Union arrived. So now it's really starting to get this multicultural mix, and it's starting to change the food, the flavor, um, the interaction, and all of this. Akko is becoming this really interesting, interesting cultural, let's call it soup, because everyone likes soup, right? Um, now, uh, over this time, the population balance of Akko between Jews and Arabs um, has shifted with some Arabs moving to the northern neighborhoods as some Jewish residents move to new housing developments in nearby Naharia. Naharia? I don't know if I'm saying it right. Regardless, the city still has a clear Jewish majority, and in 2011, Akko's population of 46,000 included 30,000 Jews and 14,000 Arabs. So there is a Jewish majority, but there is a large Muslim population. And you have to give credit to Akko for maintaining this balance between these two, two, <coughs> excuse me. And I'm going to say disparate cultures, but they're not that disparate. Um, they're not that different. These cultures see a lot of things similarly. The news likes to tell you that they are too diametrically opposed, but they're not. They exist in relative harmony. And Akko is a testament to this. So in the south of Akko, along the coast of Haifa Bay, is an industrial, well, an industrial zone was established and it was called Steel City. And there were a lot of different businesses in there. In the 1990s, that kind of fluctuated and, and not phased itself out, but it went through a little mini recession, I guess. And, uh, but it's remained an industrial zone and more businesses have moved in and there is, there now is the tambour paint factory as well as other industrial businesses and haifa bay has um a distinction at being uh one of the most still one of the most moved through ports um in the Mediterranean, it's one of Israel's main ports through Haifa itself. Um, and a lot of the stuff that's moved out and in um, comes to Akko, to that industrial center. That's pretty cool. Um, now, it is the also the trade and administrative hub for the Western Galilee, um, just as it's been since uh, back to the British Mandate. And included in its municipal area are a government experimental agricultural station. And that was founded under the British mandate. And this one is cool. I had to look this up. I learned about this. And this is so awesome. Um, and the Berit Ahim Kafar Philadelphia Youth Village. Now, youth villages are boarding schools modeled by Henrietta Zold and Rekha Freire 
that were first developed in the British Mandate in the 1930s to care for groups of children and teenagers fleeing the Nazis. Whoa. It is a cross between a European boarding school and a kibbutz. And that's within the administrative area of Akko. How cool is that? I have to do an episode on those youth, uh, on those, what is it, youth village. That's, that's, whoa, I'm blown away. That's so cool. Um, and Akko has one. So Akko uh, also has a religious significance for Muslims with its al Jazar Mosque being the largest within Israel's pre-1967 borders. So it is the largest mosque um, within those those borders. And that is, that's, that's, wow, that's pretty cool. And it's a historic mosque. It's not just a mosque that was thrown up. It's one that goes all the way back to Sheikh Jazar. Um, wow, crazy. Um and it is, along with Haifa, um, the one of the world centers for the Baha'i faith. So you have the Baha'i gardens in um, in Haifa. And in Akko, you have the grave of one of the significant individuals, um, religious figures from the Baha'i faith. I didn't put his name in here. I'm sorry. A um, lot of writing, a lot of research. And I apologize for missing it. But uh, look it up. It's pretty cool. Um, the Baha'i Baha faith is really interesting, too. So check that out. Um, there are also numerous Christian churches of different denominations, including Roman Catholic, Maronite, Melkite, as well as others. And Akko is also home to a considerable number of synagogues, making it one of the most religious, diverse cities in the world. Not just in Israel, but in the world. And everyone just does what they do. They go fishing for their work. They eat. They live. They raise their kids. And they just exist. And that's the model for what should be, I think. Um, have there been tensions throughout the past? I think there was one story about a Muslim man who drove through a Jewish neighborhood on Yom Kippur and it caused a kerfuffle. And, you know, if that's the worst thing, I'm okay with that. Um, overall, everyone seems to get along really well. Um, so the violent history... I feel so bad saying that. The violent history of Akko comes to an otherwise happy ending. Now, I'm going to take another sip of coffee real quick, and then I'm going to tell you about a bunch of things in Akko that you should see when you go there. And I took it from a wonderful website, um, text everything, the list, everything, and I'm going to give credit to those guys, and I'm going to put a link to it in the, uh, in the description. Give me a moment. I'm going to have a cup of coffee. Well, not an entire cup, a sip. All right, so these are the things that if you go to Akko, you've got to check them out. The first one is the fortifications, the wall that surrounds the old city of Akko. Now, Akko's incredible surviving walls, which wrap around the old city, are the town's most distinctive feature. For panoramic skyline views across Akko, Walking along these ancient defensive barriers cannot be beaten. The fortifications were given their present form by Ahmed El Jazar in the 18th century. Uh, from Wiseman Street, you can climb up onto the ramparts and walk to the northeast corner, dominated by the massive tower known as the Burj El Kumandar. It stands on the foundations of the accursed tower, from which Richard the Lion what dude though i'm thinking kevin costner robin hood movie um richard the lionheart hauled down the duke of austria's banner in 1191 a little further south from here cited in the walls is the treasures in the wall museum which has an ethnographic collection of artifacts from early zionist settlers in the area if you head back East along the wall towards the sea, you come to the Berg Kurajim 
which is the Tower of the Vine, the Ottoman bulwark built to defend the town against sea attacks, is built on foundations dating from the Crusader period. So that that was actually, we watched the video, my son and I, um, it was an aerial view, and I'm going to put that in the description too as I was prepping this, uh, prepping this episode. And that was the first thing he said. He goes, whoa, those walls, those are so cool. They go all the way around the city. I said, yeah. He said, can you go up on them? I said, we will, Bob, we will. All right, so next is the Ahmed Al Jazar Mosque. That's another thing you should see when you're there. Occupying the site of the Crusader Cathedral, the Ahmed Al Jazar Mosque was built in 1781 on the model of an Ottoman domed mosque. The courtyard is entered by a flight of steps, on the right of which is a small Rococo style kiosk. Surrounding the arcaded courtyard are rooms which once provided accommodation for pilgrims and Islamic scholars. So this was a seat of Islamic scholarship. That's pretty, I didn't know that. Um, on the east side of the arcaded gallery, steps lead down to a cistern dating from the Crusader era, which provided a water supply for Akko's population when the town was under siege um it is a small plain dome building oh no there is a small plain dome building to the right of the prayer hall entrance and that contains the mausoleum of Ahmed al jazar he's buried right there who died in 1804 and of his successor suleiman pasha the mosque itself with its tall, slender minaret, is a fine example of Turkish Rococo architecture. With a mammoth interior decorated in an ornate blue, brown, and white motif. Um, the grand bulk of Ahmed al Jazar's 18th century citadel sits just inside the old city walls and is one of Akko's major points of interest. During the British Mandate period, it was used as a prison by the British and today houses the Museum of Underground Prisoners. This museum commemorates the Jewish fighters who were imprisoned or executed here by the British authorities during the Mandate era with a collection of black and white photographs and original documents from that time. So I didn't realize, well, I knew Akko was small, but I didn't realize that they were right next to each other. That's pretty crazy. Um, wow. So, um, next in things to see would be the Crusader City, which is underneath Ahmed al Jazar's citadel, and it's, um, the highlight of a citadel visit, according to this list. Um, the Crusader City, their historic site comprises a fascinating series of Gothic vaulted halls which were once headquarters to the Crusader armies. The Knights Hall and the Dining Hall here are grand examples of the soaring and inspired Crusader style of architecture. There is also a series of narrow subterranean tunnels uh, to explore once you fish, finish visiting the halls. Definitely not recommended for claustrophobic uh, people. So, and this... Uh, leads down to a crypt. Oh. So, yeah, that's pretty cool. You should go down there, check that out if you go. But that is fascinating that you have all these different layers of Akko's history just, like, screaming at you all at once. Um, and another thing to see is called the Khan al-Umdan, the Khan al Umdan, which is the Khan of the Columns, and I'm going to explain what that is, um, gained its name because of the granite and porphyry, 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 porphyry columns that, <laughs> that Ahmed al Jazar um, brought from Kizaria to build this Khan. Now, built on the site of the Crusaders' Dominican monastery. The Khan provided traveling merchants with accommodations while trading in the city, and it set around a large rectangular courtyard. Now, the ground floor rooms would have been used for storage and stables, while the upstairs would have been sleeping quarters for the merchants. And over the north entrance 
is the clock tower commemorating Sultan Abdul Hamid's Jubilee in 1906. So the Khan, this was something that was established by the Ottomans. And these were these big merchant trading houses um, where all the trade was done. It's pretty, pretty... Uh, pretty amazing idea and it led to well everything's concentrated think about it everything's concentrated in one place taxation is incredibly easy boom done drop the mic um another great thing to see is what well, the crusader tunnel so remember i was telling you about the underground and the different layers well there is a crusader tunnel that you can check out and if you are not claustrophobic it says this eerie crusader tunnel is one of Akko's most intriguing tourist attractions. Now, it was discovered in 1994 by a plumber. What? Um, and the subterranean passage would have originally connected the harbor with a Templar palace. Um, I apologize. That is a rice cooker in the next room going off. Um, this subterranean passage would have originally connected the harbor with a Templar palace, providing a secret escape route to the sea in case of attack. Um, today it runs from Haganah Street to the Khan Al Umdan and provides a fascinating glimpse into Crusader architecture. A walk through here is highly recommended. Um, if you are at all interested in the medieval Crusader history of the town, it is fascinating. Um, and the fact that it still exists and is safe enough for you to tool around in is amazing so if you can go go um saint john's church is another uh thing to see when you're in akko and by far akko's most picturesque church saint john's church was built in 1737 wow it's older than most churches in america um and occupies the site of an earlier 12th century crusader church way older um, dedicated to St. Andrew. The church's interior is rather plain, and the main reason most people visit is to photograph the facade. Um, the juxtaposition of the church's crisp white walls and bright red bell tower surrounded by the crumbling stone walls of Akko's seafront makes this one of Akko's prettiest scenes for photographers. Uh, come here in the late afternoon to capture the softest light. That was so nice of them. And now, nice of me to give to you. Hold on, I need another cup of coffee. As you could tell, my voice is just, um, uh, but I'm doing it for you. I do it for the kids. <laughs> All right, coffee, boom, done, moving on. Um, another thing to see, which you're going to see it no matter what, is Akko's Harbor. Now home to uh now home to colorful local fishing boats and yachts akko's harbor was a busy and important port for the classical age right on up until the medieval period during the crusader era crusader era it could sometimes have occupied as many as 80 ships so imagine 80 ships in your mind and look at a picture of akko i can't even see that um, the original port has now silted up and all that is left is a small tranquil fishing harbor. From here, you can hop on a tourist boat, uh, to head out onto the Mediterranean and get excellent views of Akko's old city from the sea. And that is something definitely do. It's absolutely amazing. Um, now another thing to see is the Hammam Al Pasha Museum. This old hammam, which is a Turkish bath, this is so cool, has been fully restored and is now home to an interesting museum with exhibits on the history and culture of the Turkish bath experience. Sign me up. The dioramas here walk visitors through the entire bathing process, explaining the separate functions of the hot room and the cold room showcasing the architecture of the hammam and showing how the hammam would have been heated. The hammam al Pasha dates from the 18th century and was a working Turkish bath right up until the 1940s. What? 
this is so cool and you get to actually be there you don't get the bait but you get to check it out and you get to experience history that's actually one of the fun things about israel museums is they're very user interactive so i definitely will be checking out that museum um now if you go to any city in israel especially akko you have to go to the old city shook every city shook is a must but akko's is amazing um akko's main shook marketplace is right in the center of the old city and is a fun and vibrant bazaar full of fresh produce, cheap eats, buckets of spices, and souvenirs. If you're looking for an original gift to bring home, it's a great place to browse for textiles and bric-a-brac, meaning you want to get scarves and stuff like that. The scarves in Israel, I bring them home to people and they lose their minds, and you find them in the shook. Um, now... You'll have to get your haggling hat on, it says, if you want a good price from the vendors. But if you're not shopping, strolling through this area is worthwhile simply to experience the bustle of local shoppers and take in the smells and sights of a traditional Shook district. Now, there's also food, and the food that you get in a Shook is... Getting food in the restaurants is amazing, but getting street food in a Shook, if you're in Israel and you don't do it, you're you're missing out you're losing out on the experience that is israel the street food and the shook is where you're going to get it um i got two more things oh i did find it i did have it yay so um the baha the baje baha'i center is another thing to see and for some time out from historic sightseeing take a trip to the beautiful gardens of bah baj which contain the shrine of Baha'u'llah, founder of the Baha'i faith. He was exiled to Akko in 1868 and spent the last years of his life in the Red Roof House in the garden. So you're actually, Akko is where the founder was exiled to and lived. So just like the more famous Baha'i gardens of Haifa, the gardens here are a spectacular sight of landscape flower beds and shady trees. And it is an amazingly tranquil place for an afternoon wander. Now, I've been to the Baha'i Gardens in Haifa, and there is nothing like it. And if these are even a skosh like them, then this is literally heaven on earth. And you've got to go. Um, definitely, you have to go. So, last on the list of things to do in Akko is the Lohame Ha Getaot. Now, the kibitz, the, the, the kibitz, <laughs> yeah, I'm getting towards the end, can you tell? All right, the kibbutz of Lohame Ha Getaot was founded in 1949 by Polish and Lithuanian Jews who had spent World War II fighting the Nazis. It is home to a moving museum dedicated to the Jewish resistance and the Holocaust. On the ground floor displays illustrating the history of Vilnius, the Jerusalem of Lithuania. We should, I should do an episode on that. And the town's Jewish community from 1551 to 1940. There is material on the early days of the socialist and Zionist movement at the end of the 19th century, the Bundists, um, and, the and the objects illustrating the everyday life of Polish Jews, as well as an exhibit of some 2,000 drawings and paintings by concentration camp prisoners, including portraits of inmates. Um, Akko is fascinating. It is one of the great cities of the world, not just of Israel. Um, Israel is, ha is honored to have it be a part of its land, of its country. Um, and it is also a testament to how peace can be achieved, how harmony can be achieved, at least on a religious level, um, and even on a communal level. Um, I love Akko. I enjoyed bringing Akko to you. 
Um, and there you go. All right. Um, that's it. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, all right. If this is your first time watching, uh, don't forget to hit the like button and the subscribe button. If you want to follow us, uh, if you'd like to download this, you can find us on SoundCloud, iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, TuneIn, and Spotify and take us with you when you go run, when you go uh, to the gym or when you're driving in the car. So please do that. Um, also, as I said, this video was brought to you by uh, the 12 Cities in Israel Modern Hebrew Flashcards. Um, they are available on Amazon for Kindle and our next one I just finished. I just finished literally this week. I just finished no Hebrew numbers. So um, it's fun. I got some math concepts in there, plus minus. Um, uh, and, and I think you're really gonna enjoy it. I've been releasing a couple of them on Instagram and they'll be out within the next couple of weeks. Uh, they're going through the re review process to make sure I did my job. Um, all right, that's it. Todo va. Leitro ve. Yalla bye. Shati la perach anishar